We want to welcome you today to the worship here at the Regency Congregation. It's certainly good to see everyone, and I hope that uh, your week has gone well. But this is the best way to begin a week as we come together to worship the Lord. And Psalm 122 begins, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. So I hope that that is our attitude. I hope that is our emotion, that we are certainly glad this morning that we can come together to the house of the Lord and participate in this worship service. So we've come, of course, as I've said to you a number of times, we come to encounter our wonderful, awesome, great God. We come also to be edified, to be built up, to be strengthened in our faith. But we also come, if we have opportunity to engage anyone who may be seeking to have that relationship with God. So again, I pray that we've come with that attitude this morning that I am certainly glad and we are glad that we can come to the house of the Lord. And let us pray as we begin our worship today. Our Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for this time that we can come together. What an opportunity this is for us to encounter you, the wonderful, awesome, all-powerful, all-loving God, but also the opportunity for us to be strengthened, to be built up as we hear the word, as we have the fellowship with one another. And Father, we just thank you for this opportunity. And I pray, Father, that we've come with the attitude of the psalmist, that we all are so very glad and happy that we can come this morning into the house of the Lord. Be with us, Father, and I pray that our worship will certainly be in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We praise Thee, O God, for the Son of Thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. We praise Thee, O God, for the Spirit of light, who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. If the skies above you are gray, you are feeling so blue. If your cares and burdens seem great all the whole day through, there's a silver lining that shines in the heavenly land. Look by faith and see it, my friend, trust in his promises, grand. Sing and he'll be happy to have a press along to the tool of gold. Trust in him who leadeth the way to he is good, keep your soul. Let the world away, be faithful, look to Jesus and pray and pray. Lift your voice and praise him in song, sing and be happy today. Oft we fail to see the rainbow up in heaven's fair sky. When it seems the fortunes of earth frown and pass us by, there are things we know that are worth more than silver and gold. If we hope and trust Him each day, we shall have pleasure untold. Sing and you'll be happy, be happy, press along to the goal. Trust in Him who leadeth the way to He is good, your soul. your soul. Let the world go away, be thankful, look to Jesus and pray and pray. Lift your voice and praise Him in song. Sing and be happy today. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. 
Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture, now burst on my sight. Angels descending, bring from above, echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I am my Savior, am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Praising my Savior all the day long. So last Monday morning, I'm going for a jog, and I'm listening to this podcast about sports. And in the podcast, they're talking about many of the things that are going on in our world, in our, in our country right now. They were talking about the pandemic. They were talking about the protest over racial injustices. And the person being interviewed was a sports writer by the name of Howard Beck. And he said a line that really caught my attention. He said, we don't need to go back to normal. We need to reimagine normal. That really caught my attention. We need to reimagine normal. So today we're wrapping up this series called A New Normal. We've spent the last four weeks talking about what is God trying to do right now Could God be using the situations that we're dealing with today? Can He use that to create a new normal? And how can we emerge from these stressful times, not only as better humans, but as more committed and more faithful children of God? And if we allow God to define what normal is instead of our culture, then what could normal really look like? Well, first, a little background on our current state of normal. So about a hundred years before Jesus was born, there was a Roman philosopher named Lucretius who wrote an epic poem called On the Nature of Things. Now, an epic poem is not epic because it's really awesome. It just means it's really long. In fact, when you translate it into English, this poem is over 300 pages long. I'm going to summarize for you what this poem was about, or at least I'm going to summarize Google's summary on what this poem was about. In this poem, Lucretius basically says that life is about pleasure, that the ultimate goal of every human life should be to seek pleasure. And as a result, we should avoid pain at all costs. We should avoid discomfort. We should avoid any kind of suffering, anything that will keep us from seeking ultimate pleasure should be discarded. Now, here's what's interesting. You could write this poem today and it would absolutely apply. You see, self-fulfillment is the focus of so many people today, possibly even you and I. If your job doesn't fulfill you, just quit and get a new one. If your marriage isn't fulfilling you, leave it and get a new one. If your life isn't fulfilling you, then buy a boat, have an affair, Do something that's going to bring that kind of rush and excitement back to your life. Now, if self-fulfillment really is the highest goal of life, then you shouldn't criticize the choices that anyone else makes because they are simply seeking 
to find fulfillment. And if self-fulfillment is really the highest goal of life, then you need to discover who you truly are by looking within. You need to discover your true identity or who you think you really are. Now, hear me on this. There's nothing wrong with enjoying life. But when pleasure is your ultimate destination, then destruction is in your path. Because in that moment, when pleasure is your ultimate goal, you have become your own God. About a hundred years later, there was a man named Jesus from Nazareth who began teaching that pleasure is not the ultimate goal of life, but renewal is God's ultimate goal for each of us. And as a result, we should not avoid suffering at all costs. We should endure suffering because God can use those experiences to renew us and to bless other people. And he taught that actually denial of self and denial of our own desires is actually the beginning to becoming one of his followers. These two visions are at war with each other today. And and if we're being honest, those of us as Christians must admit that we are really struggling with these two competing narratives. We struggle with this idea of seeking pleasure at all cost and with denying self and following Jesus. There was a book written by Gabe Lyons and David Kinnaman called Good Faith. I want to read a, a couple of sentences from that book to you that I find really challenging and fascinating. They said, part of the problem is that too many in the Christian community have bought into unbiblical notions about what it means to live a good life. So it doesn't look to outsiders like we're doing anything special. Rather than living as a counter-cultural community that bears witness to the coming kingdom of God, many of us go with the cultural flow, thoughtlessly consuming products, ideas, and aspirations streamed for us in an unending deluge of retweets and Facebook likes. It's so hard in this screen age to keep our attention focused on anything for very long, much less a way of life introduced to Middle Eastern peasants 2,000 years ago. You might could say we have become comfortable with normal. You know what normal is, right? It means conforming to a standard. It means usual typical and expected. And the more comfortable we become with normal, the less committed we are to Jesus. And so we don't need to go back to normal. We need to reimagine normal. There's something that Paul wrote in a letter to the church at Rome that I believe is so powerful for us today. I want us to take some time to study through just two verses that he wrote that I believe will absolutely help us reimagine what normal should look like. It's a text found in Romans chapter 12, the first two verses. Here's what Paul writes. He says, Therefore, I urge you, I beg with you, I plead with you. It's like the wife who is begging for her husband not to leave. It's like the parents who are begging for their child to reconsider the choices that they're making. It's like the single parent who's behind on the rent and who's behind on the bills that is begging for the collectors to give them just a little bit more time. Paul says, I beg with you. I plead with you. In in view of God's mercies. He, He doesn't resort to the judgment of God. He doesn't resort to fear. He actually resorts to the grace of God. He calls for us to think about what God has done in our life, the unconditional love that God has shown to you and I in view of God's mercies. Offer your bodies. It's interesting that he says, offer your bodies. You know, true commitment is not really seen in words. Don't tell me that you love me. Show me that you love me. When he says offer your bodies, he's calling for us to give total commitment, to offer all of us, not just a part of us, not just a segment of us, not just a little bit of our time, not just a couple of hours a week, all of me, all of you, all the time. That's why he says offer your bodies, your whole selves, your entire beings, offer that as a living sacrifice. You see, a living sacrifice, it means that it's voluntary, but it also means that it's daily. 
And you have to willingly lay down on the altar of sacrifice as a living sacrifice. Now this goes against Lucretia's poem on the nature of things. His life goal was pleasure, not sacrifice. But here's something that you know. If it's worth it, then you really don't mind the sacrifice. And so Paul continues, Offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. And then he says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Do not conform. Remember when you were a child, did you play with Plato? I love Plato. It's fascinating. Now, I'm not very good at playing with Plato. I I was never one of those that could make all of these amazing shapes out of Plato. But what's so fascinating about Plato is that whatever you want it to be, or for me, whatever you imagined it could be, it really was. And what's beautiful about Plato is that in order to create any kind of shape, you simply need to press and form And you press it and you roll it out and you squeeze it and you mush it and you use it with your hands and you can create anything that your imagination can come up with. That's the beauty of Plato. When Paul writes in Romans 12 verse 2, do not conform, that word conform means don't be pressed. Don't be shaped by the culture of this world. You know, it's, it's a struggle really not to be conformed to this world because sometimes we don't even realize it. You see, it's so easy to conform. You don't have to do anything. It requires no effort. It requires no intentionality, no discipline. You just simply do what everyone else does. It's really easy to be normal. But maybe the current situation, maybe the current crises has revealed some things to you and has caused you to rethink some things about normal. Some of us realize we don't want our marriages to be like everyone else. We want stronger marriages. Some of us realize we really can spend more time together as a family. Some of us uh, realize that all of the things that were keeping us so busy all of a sudden came to a screeching halt. Many of us had our eyes opened to the struggles and the outcries of some of our brothers and sisters in Christ who were calling out the injustices that are taking place in our world, that were calling out the prejudices that fill so many hearts. And I know for me, and maybe for you, there have been things in my life that I have said, why do I do that? Why was I ever that busy? Why do things have to be this way? And I hope that you can hear God shouting above it all, above all the other distracting voices that God is saying, it doesn't have to be this way. That's not normal. And so we simply need to reimagine normal. And Paul is pleading with us through God to change the way we think. And so he says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Andy Stanley says that change happens when the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of change. It's like when the doctor told you that you're going to have to change your eating and exercising habits because if you don't, the results could be disastrous. I think of Blockbuster. Do you remember Blockbuster? Man, it was so awesome to go to Blockbuster on a Friday night and pick out the movie that we were going to watch until Netflix. And then they would mail you the movie. You didn't even have to leave your home. And now you can simply stream it on your TV or on your device. Blockbuster refused to change, and the results were disastrous. For us, we can't go back to normal because it was destroying our faith. It was destroying our families, and it was definitely destroying our future. But changing the way you live requires you to change the way you think. Because if you think the way you used to think, then you will live the way that you used to live. And so in order to renew your mind, it means to restore your mind. Have you ever restored an old piece of furniture? You know that you can't just slap a new coat of paint on an old piece of furniture. You've got to sand it down. You've got to strip away all the old. Because if you don't, the new will not bond to that piece of furniture. And so you've got to take the work to strip it down to its base and then restore it. 
That's exactly what God is calling for us to do. He's calling for us to strip our thinking down to the way that God intended it to be. It's why every time you've tried to change before, it didn't work because you didn't renew your mind. You didn't change the way you think. Sincerity and commitment are not enough. They just simply don't cut it. Remember those New Year's resolutions that you had planned on keeping? You remember that exercise program at the beginning of the year that you were going to hold tight to? Sincerity and commitment just don't cut it. So let's reimagine normal. Let's allow God to restore to our minds normal, the way that He defines normal. Because if we can see the world as God sees the world, we will begin to do what God wants us to do. So, three quick points of application for you. Three ways that God is trying to redefine and reimagine normal for us. The first thing is simply this. See people as image bearers, not as objects. We're trained by our culture to see people as objects, to see people for their bodies, to see people for their abilities, to see people for their resources, even to see people for their skin colors. But that's not how God created us. God created us in His image. We all bear the image of God, and therefore we are all image bearers. And so when you look at an individual, don't see them for what's on the outside. Don't see them the way that culture wants you to see them. See them as an image bearer. And that's why every person should be treated with dignity and respect. Regardless of the color of their skin, regardless of their vocation, regardless of whether they want to support the police or defund the police, regardless of who they are voting for in November, regardless of whether or not they believe we should have to wear masks in public, every image bearer should be treated with dignity and respect because we are image bearers, not objects. Number two, remember that busy does not equal better. You don't have to live at such a fast pace of life. It's not normal. Are we overly busy because we don't want to slow down and think about who we are really becoming? And think of the damage that being so busy was causing to our faith, it was causing to our families, it was even causing to our own health. And if most of the things in your life were stripped away during the time of quarantine or sheltering in place, then anything you add back is strictly your choice. So choose carefully. Thirdly, live with the end in mind. Psalm 90 verse 12 says, Teach us to number our days that we might gain a heart of wisdom. When you learn to count your days, you can really learn to make your days count. I love how the New Century Version translates Psalm 90 verse 12. It says, teach us how short our lives really are so that we can be wise. Life is short. So live with the end in mind. Because when you do, you'll live with more purpose. Every day will have meaning because every day is important. You'll live with more generosity. There's no need to hoard up all of this stuff. There's no need to be selfish with it. I should give it away. I should give generously because life is short. You'll live with more peace. Some of the things that used to get you anxious are just really not that big of a deal in the grand scheme of things. Life is short. Why spend it with so much anxiety? You'll live with more grace. We all make mistakes. None of us is perfect. One day we're all going to stand in front of our Creator. We're going to trust in the grace of Jesus. So live with more grace. Live with the end in mind. What's interesting is this is just simply a quick summary of the things that Jesus taught in what we call the Sermon on the Mount. You can read the Sermon on the Mount in the Gospel of Matthew chapters 5 through 7. I'd encourage you to spend some time reading through His lesson, His sermon. Because in that text, He actually shows us what normal originally was intended to be. So don't rush back into what culture has defined as normal. Don't waste this opportunity that God has given you to hit the reset button on your life. Reimagine normal, but reimagine it the way that God created normal to be. Because when you do, what you'll find is that normal is not normal. You'll find that what God calls normal will blow your mind.
Let's pray. Father, thank you for so many gifts. Thank you for bringing good out of tragedy. Thank you for showing us grace and giving us so many opportunities to press the reset button. Father, for any person that needs to give their life to you, I pray that they would take that next step in their faith, that they would make a call, reach out to someone to find out how to become a Christian, to, be, to find out how to become a follower of Jesus. Father, for those of us who are struggling with these competing narratives of pleasure versus sacrifice, God, help us to see that the way you've created us is truly the greatest way to live. Father, give us the courage, the conviction to live what you call normal, not what our world calls normal. Thank you for this opportunity to reset and to reimagine a new normal. And we pray all these things in the beautiful name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. So this week, the youth group was supposed to go on our mission trip to Atlanta. We've done this for years. It's a great trip that I always look forward to. I think our students do as well. And on this trip, we'll go and we'll spend a few days loving on these kids, these children, uh, and their staff at Corners Outreach in Atlanta. And it's a neat opportunity to show them the love of Jesus and just spend time with these children. So I'm, I'm disappointed that the, we're not heading there this week. I know our students are disappointed as well, but one of the things I tell our students when we're on the trip is that a mission is not a trip. The mission is what we are a part of each and every day, whether we're on a trip serving kids in Atlanta or whether we're at home here in Mobile. The mission is not the trip. The mission is what we're a part of, and our mission is to live like Jesus and to share his love. Our mission is to love God and to love our neighbor. And so this is an important reminder at this time is that our mission is still active. Our mission is something, even though we're not on a trip, we're still a part of it right now. And so we need to be reminded of that. Another reminder that we have every week is when we take the Lord's Supper, when we eat the bread and drink the cup, we are reminded of our mission. And I think it's important that we do this every single week to be reminded not only of what Jesus did for us on the cross, but also our responsibility to proclaim that to the world around us. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26. He says, For what, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so let's do that together. Let's proclaim Jesus' death until he comes. And let's be reminded of our mission. Let's bow together as we take this bread. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the mission that we are allowed to be a part of. We're thankful for the sacrifice on the cross, for the broken body, and that thing that Jesus did, that important moment in history when he died on the cross and rose from the dead that allows us to have a relationship with you. We love you, God. We're thankful for your son. It's in his name we pray. Amen. I know this cup looks a little bit different but it still serves the same purpose. It reminds us of the blood that was shed on the cross. And so let's now pray for the cup. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the blood that was shed. We're thankful that that blood washes over us and allows us to be forgiven of our sins. God, we are so blessed. God, may that reminder of taking this cup remind us of what we're to do each and every day, which is to tell others about uh, your love for them and your love for us and the sacrifice that was made on the cross. In your son Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks so much for joining us for worship. We hope you, your heart has been encouraged from our time together today. Again, if you're looking for ways to give, uh, you can give through our website at regencycc.org or you can mail uh, your offering or drop it by the church building Monday through Friday, anytime between 8 and 3. Uh, if you have anything that you need right now, any need for encouragement or prayer, please let us know. Uh, we're here to help, we, to help you and to encourage you. And once again, just want to remind you, 
about our summer series that's going on. Uh, we have those videos online each week. They usually post on Wednesday. So you can find those on our website, regentccc.org, or there's a link in the description of this video. Thanks again for joining us for worship, and we hope you have a great week.